communication medium is uh, error tolerant. And through this talk, we'll be trying to think about noise mediums of communication which are extremely noisy, not that much so. Uh, so the, the question that uh, came up around the uh, middle of the 20th century was uh, how do we overcome noise and achieve reliable communication? Um, there were a couple of very seminal works which sort of set the mathematical uh, tone for the rest of the, uh, uh, the research in the arena. The first of those was that of Shannon. There was the first challenge over here is to understand what is the mathematical model behind, uh, how do you model this problem mathematically? And Shannon uh, introduced a very elegant framework where he said, let's model the noise as if it's a probabilistic uh, um, effect. So the channel, let's say, is transmitting bits. It transmits every bit accurately with probability 1 minus p. And with some probability p, uh, think of it as some small number between 0 and a half. The bit gets flipped, and you get the other. Uh, so you transmit a 0, you see a 1. And uh, let's assume, for simplicity, there are many, many channels that channel could have studied and did. Uh, but let's assume, for simplicity, that we're considering this very simple channel where the bits are flipped independently. So what happens on the ith bit that we transmit is completely independent of what happens to the ith plus first bit and the nth bit, etc. And the question is, what kind of uh, communication can you carry out on this channel? For a while it was considered, probably, I mean, it was a, a popular belief before Shannon's work that really if you want to um, achieve reliable communication, you want to transmit, say, k bits, then, and you want the entire k-bit sequence to be uh, received accurately by the receiver, well, you should probably transmit each bit, repeat it log k times. That would be about the right thing, and that would work well. So, uh, Shannon was modeling the uh, errors in this channel by, um, <coughs> by uh, say, a single parameter. What is the probability with which a bit is flipped? And among other things that Shannon proposed, something that we take for granted today, but something which would not probably uh, be very natural at that time, given that computers did not exist, and even a very rudimentary notion of communication was hardly implemented, Shannon proposed two algorithms in order to implement the process of communication. Before sending information, the sender should encode the information, expand the k-bit sequence into a longer n-bit sequence, and then transmit this n-bit string on the channel. The receiver, on the other hand, would decode the n-bit sequence, which is somewhat longer than the message that it's expecting, and then compress it to the k-bit sequence, hopefully in the process somehow squeezing out the error. That's the physical analogy we think of. Uh, how, it has to, how it can be done or has to be done is the essential question. However, Shannon proposed we should consider these two algorithms, consider them as variables. What kinds of algorithms could you have? and try to uh, figure out how well can you use the channel. What is the notion of utility of the channel? Well, the ratio. You really are sending k bits, but in order to do that, you're using the channel which transmits a single bit each time, you're using it n times. So you want to use as large a ratio of k over n as possible. <laughs> At the same time, you have to deal with a fraction p of errors. How can you map, what kind of relationships can you get between this ratio k over n and p? And Shannon gave this beautiful meta theorem. There was many, many special instantiations of which he proved. And these theorems said basically that every channel in a very broad class has a capacity associated with it, some positive real number. And if you try to fuse this channel at rates below this capacity, then you'll be successful. And if you are trying to transmit it at rates above this capacity, it will be utterly un in uh, unsuccessful. And in both cases, he said, basically, if you're transmitting at rate slightly less than this capacity, you'll be successful with exponentially large probability, uh, exponentially large in the length of the messages that you're transmitting. And on the other hand, if you're trying to transmit above this capacity, then you will be making errors with probability which is all but exponentially small. So you're really going to be utterly unsuccessful. An example of this kind of an effect, let's go back to this binary symmetric channel where each bit is bit flipped with probability p. And Shannon's result showed that this channel has a capacity which is 1 minus the entropy function of p. Entropy
entropy function of P is a function which I haven't formally defined here. Let me just tell you what the implications of this result are for some very interesting, you know, from choices of P which are interesting. If P equals zero, what does that mean? Every bit that you transmit is communicated faithfully. We know that these things don't exist in practice, but mathematically we can define them. And of course, over here there is nothing to do. You just transmit bits as they are. So the capacity is one. Shannon theorem says so. On the other hand, if the bit fitting, flipping probability is a half, so you transmit a bit which is a zero, the receiver receives either zero or one with equal probability. You transmit a one, the receiver receives a zero or one with equal probability. The receiver's input, uh, receiver's uh, uh, signal has no correlation at all with what you're sending. You could talk a coin and simulate this channel. So presumably this channel should have no capacity, no communication capacity, and indeed Shannon's theorem says exactly that. In between, as P varies from zero to half, the capacity of this channel decreases in a monotone fashion. What does that imply? In particular, if 49% of the bits that you're transmitting are flipped, and 51% are not getting flipped, so there's a very tiny correlation between what you're sending and what the receiver is receiving. One would think that this kind of a channel is almost not utilizable, but Shannon's theorem says no, it is utilizable, and in fact you get some positive capacity. Maybe in order to utilize this channel fruitfully, you might have to pad, you know, expand every bit into a thousand bits. But nevertheless, there is some positive capacity associated with this channel, it can be utilized. And indeed, these kinds of very, very large rates of error are not unreasonable. When you send out a satellite with an extremely low power transmitter sitting in it, and it's trying to beam the signals back to Earth, well, presumably there will be a large amount of error, co cosmic radiation, whatever, what have you, that will introduce a large amount of error in the communication, but nevertheless there will be some correlation between what the channel is, uh, what the sender is sending, and what the receiver is receiving. And this correlation, Shannon's theorem says, is good enough for you to be able to utilize this channel fruitfully. And this became a model for much of practic the practice in communication since then. There were a few gaps, of course, with Shannon's theorem. You couldn't use it as it is because it was completely non-constructive. The coding algorithm that Shannon suggested was just run through all possible messages and figure out which one was, could have been the one that was sent. So this is not an algorithmic result. In fact, if decoding at exponential time sounds bad, encoding was even worse. It was doubly exponential time. He said, pick an encoding function among the entire space of all encoding functions at random. So that's doubly exponentially large space to be looking over at. So this, this theorem was hardly constructive, but nevertheless became the basis for future search searches. In 1955, before the notion of polynomial time was developed, Elias gave essentially a polynomial time algorithm which could utilize every channel which has positive capacity at some positive rate. So this might not match Shannon's theorem constructively, but it would say if this channel has capacity, you can use it. Not at the rate Shannon suggests, but something lower. Later in 1966, even at this time, the notion of polynomial time was still only being, you know, sort of mulled over in theoretical computer science. Dave Forney gave us very, very constructive result. It actually achieved polynomial time algorithms with exponentially small error probability that would achieve any rate less than the capacity. Okay, so you can get as good, so you can match Shannon's theorem algorithmically efficiently. The encoding would be polynomial time, the decoding would be polynomial time, and this was virtually the gold standard. And modern results following, uh, in particular, a work of Spielman's in 96, leads to actually linear time algorithms for all of these problems. So these problems look like they're wonderfully well solved. So what else do we have to talk about? Well, I want to uh, talk about the notion of errors. Han Shannon's notion of errors, that errors are independent and probabilistic, is a somewhat benign notion of errors. One could, have, could consider many scenarios where errors are not independent. You could still model them probabilistically, but over time we are starting to encounter notions of communication channels where the error does not appear to be um, you know, oblivious to the encoding mechanism and to the decoding mechanism and to what is being sent. There are lots of active participants in the communication channels nowadays and they tend to intrude in a much more perverse manner. So how do we model such 
sources of error. One model proposed by Hamming, also around the same time as Shannon, in fact, these works were interdependent uh, chronologically, he proposed that we should model errors adversarially. So, some adversary is going to come along, figure out how you are planning to encode messages, how the receiver is planning to decode messages, and then say, well, this is the message that we want to transmit, and then say, this is the error that I want to introduce after you've encoded it. So, it comes along in an extremely, extremely uh, constructive manner, and comes along and tries to say if it can ruin communication. Even under this very, very perverse notion of errors, you can correct errors. It's actually remarkable, and you can actually correct a positive fraction of errors with very good rate. <coughs> However, the numbers are not quite the same. Let me tell you a little bit more about Hamming's method of studying this thing. Rather than focusing on the encoding function and the decoding function, which are the only objects that Shannon just talked about, having looked at what was the essential characteristic of this encoding function which makes encoding work. And he said, well, it doesn't really matter how you choose to represent your messages, what the exact mapping is from the image, from the uh, from the n -letter, k letter strings to the n letter strings that you're building. All that matters is which set of n letter strings you get mapped to. What are the all possible strings that you might ever transmit, try to transmit on the channel? This he called the error correcting code. This introduces one of the themes of the title today. And this is the object that he studied. And he said, well, if this code includes strings which are too close to each other, where you have to change very few coordinates to get from one valid sequence that was transmitted by the sender to another potential valid sequence that could have been transmitted by the sender, then errors are inevitable. And this notion he formalized by looking at this thing, the distance that he defined, which we since call the Hamming distance. The Hamming distance between two strings x and y is the number of coordinates that you have to change, to change the string x into the string y. It's a symmetric notion, it satisfies the triangle inequality, it allows you to start thinking about these messages that you're sending on the channel in some abstract geometric space. And that became very useful in studying error correction cap capacities of various channels. What having noticed was that if you want to transmit messages very accurately, then you should try to build error correcting codes, codes where every pair of two tra transmissions, n letter strings that you try to transmit, are very far away. Any pair that you try to look at, and compare, you have to change the string in many, many coordinates to get from one to the other. So he looked at the minimum overall possible string that he might translate, transmit of the distance between them, and that he called the distance of the code. Having noticed, and this is a fairly straightforward observation, that if you have codes of distance d, so any pair of strings that you are likely to transmit differ in at least d coordinates, then not only can you detect less than d errors, but you can even correct half as many errors. So abstractly, you're considering transmitting either this point or that. The adversary comes along, if you transmit this point, moves it to something which is within d over 2 of this original point. But you can still tell you which was the closest point, in a, uh, not in a computationally effective sense, but at least you can reason that out given infinite time, and you can figure out what might have been the message that was transmitted. So a code of distance d can correct any pattern of d minus 1 over 2 errors, and that led to a lot of development in the adversarial model of errors. So you can correct a lot of errors if you can <coughs> build good code, and you can correct good code. Yes? Uh, I'm trying to understand uh, the adversarial, the, 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 the no use of the word adversary. Is it because Shannon, uh, Hamming focused on a minimum distance where Shannon was really conceptualizing an average distance? That's Shannon true. That what that's mean, what we mean by, exactly, that's what we are uh, referring to by adversarial. Somehow the notion that you focus on the minimum of overall possible distances suggests that when you use this theory to say, well, this is the number of errors that you can correct and no more, mm. then you are postulating that somebody can come along, introduce the errors which will force you to confuse x and y. And the way they will force you to confuse x and y is they'll take a pair x and a y, which are a distance exactly d, they'll send, they'll get the receiver to, uh, the sender to send x, and then they'll corrupt it to the string which is exactly in between x and y. Exactly
exactly halfway in between. Now, the receiver cannot tell whether X was the intended message or Y was. And at that stage, we've got, we've somehow sort of, uh, this model is not allowed, we can conclude that this model does not allow D over 2 errors to be corrected. But that's assuming you assume your thinking of the errors as having been introduced by this person who had in its capacity the ability to tell the sender to send X, the ability to introduce errors in exactly the right position so that the received string looks like the midpoint of X and Y. So there's an adversary sitting there introducing the errors and that's what, and that adversary can make sure that you cannot correct any more errors than that. The study of error correcting codes uh, led to an easy result which said that uh, if you're trying to transmit uh, if lots of messages, so you have some number of messages which is asymptotically going to infinity, just the number of messages going to infinity, uh, and then goes to infinity, then you better, you know, you, you're looking at binary strings. How many, fra what fraction of coordinates could binary strings actually differ in? Well, it's not possible to construct a very large set of strings, which are all binary in, uh, in nature, and differ in more than half the coordinates. You know, you pick a random string, uh, any pair of random strings will differ and agree in half the coordinates. That's just the nature of the alphabet. So, when you're talking about binary strings, you cannot get codes whose minimum distance is greater than n over 2 if you're talking of strings of length n. Okay, so any if you give me n plus 1 string of length n, I, I'll find for you, for you in that pair, uh, in that collection, two strings whose distance between them is at most n over 2, okay, Where, which differ in only n over 2 of the best. So this is a theorem. What it implies for us is that if you're trying to transmit bits according to the uh, adversarial model, then there will be a pair of strings which differ in only 50% of the coordinates. And in order to confuse the receiver, I don't need to introduce 50% error, I only need to introduce 25% error to take you to the midpoint between these two strings. So in the adversarial channel, you can correct 25% errors. In the uh, uh, probabilistic model of errors, you can correct arbitrarily close to 50% errors. So there is a, this difference to me is more than just quantitative. It really seems to be somehow qualitatively significant. The fact that in one case, I can use any correlation between the sender and the receiver and work with that to say this is an effective model of communication to a case where I cannot deal with any correlation but rather very, very large correlation. So this turns out to be a major difference between these two models. And what I'd like to tell you about is a, a methodology by which we can try to address the gap between these two things. Do we have to live with this huge gap between the two potential models? One which assumes the errors are oblivious and, uh, and almost sort of benign, and the other one which says the errors are malevolent, but then you can deal with much, much less errors. So if we look back to this notion of why are we seeing this gap, it comes up because of this fact that there is this malicious adversary which goes picks the midpoint of two strings X and Y that we might want to transmit, and says, now you can't tell between X and Y. One thing we can do is, at least mathematically, we can re-examine this question of whether at this stage we should give up our hands and say we cannot recover any information. Or say, well, maybe there's some weak notion of recovery that we can expect and work with. And one such weak notion proposed in the 50s due to Elias and Wurzenkraft was that of list decoding. So here we postulate for the time being that the receiver will be willing to live in the following scenario. You give them a broken CD, completely scratched up, and say, well, what was the original data on it? If somebody can come along and give you 10 possible incarnations saying, this CD would have been originally one of these 10 possible channels, uh, had this one of these 10 possible sequences of information, maybe we'll be willing to live with it. If we are, then this is the model that we should be looking at. This model says, well, we broaden the notion of recovery to allow the receiver to work with a small list, to be given a small list saying one of these was the original message, but we don't know which one. And these parameters.
characterize the list size by some integer L, and we'll say, well, we'll allow a list of up to L possibilities. And if you allow a list of L possibilities, then we call a code to be PL error correcting if it has an associated decoding algorithm. Not necessarily efficient, just in the sense of being able to, you know, write down a list of L possible candidate messages that might have been transmitted by the uh, by the sender with the possibility that an adversary came along and adversarially, you know, with absolutely no modern based assumptions, changed P fraction of all the bits that were transmitted. Okay? If you have such a code, we call it P L error correcting. So there's a formal definition over here, but I won't go into it, but it can be formalized mathematically. What it says is, well, we should try to build codes which can correct a fraction of P errors using lists of size L. Guarantee, any time I get a received sequence, I'll be able to look at it, maybe for exponential time, maybe doubly exponential, I don't care, and then come up with a list of L candidates saying one of these was transmitted if the number of errors was less than or equal to, to P times N. Okay. If you have such a code, we'll call it P L error correcting. And in the notion of sh uh, the, the having notion of an error correcting code, corresponds to something like a one-half times d over n error correcting code using lists of size 1. So when you have lists of size 1, you can take a code of distance d, it corrects d over n times one-half fraction of errors. Why and this is, yes? Why is that d minus 1? Uh, it should be d minus 1, yes. Uh, I, I'm ignoring lesser order terms in n. Sure. should be d minus 1 over n times one-half is the fraction of errors that you're allowed to correct. Uh, using lists of size 1, but we'll allow larger lists and see if we can get any gains. So how many errors can we correct in this re relaxed setting? And guess what? The famed entropy function comes up again. So work in the Russian literature, in particular, lots of people worked on it. Zyablov and Pinsker were one of the many uh, people who wrote about this theme repeatedly. And one of their theorems says that if you want to build co codes that are capable of handling p fraction errors, then you can get to a rate of transmission which is 1 minus <coughs> the binary entropy of p, exactly the same function that Shannon talked about, minus an epsilon, which was also there in Shannon's thing. You could get arbitrarily close to Shannon's capacity, and this epsilon tells you how close to that capacity you can get. And if you once you fix how close you want to get, there is a certain list size which tells you that you can correct p fraction errors using lists of size s. So you just have to decide, I want to be one person close to the Shannon capacity, okay, you have to work with lists of size maybe a thousand, okay, maybe something like that, maybe it's even worse. But for every constant epsilon that you specify, there's a list. And once you decide to accept this list, you can build codes which are going to correct that fraction of errors. So this, is, to my taste at least, narrows the graph between these two models. The probabilistic model allows you to flip p fraction of the bits, but they have to be independent and random. The adversarial model allows the adversary to pick p fraction of the bits to flip. The rate you can get in both cases is 1 minus the entropy of p. In this case, you will be able to recover the message uniquely but you have to trust that this model of errors was, was very good. You have to make sure that your actual channel is really reflecting your modeling. On the other hand, you could recover a small list, and this was, will be guaranteed to recover your message, but along with a list of some small size, and you have made no assumptions about this model. So these are very, very... Uh, you know, tantalizing options, if you ask me, I would much rather trust this because if in the end your model is actually, trans, you know, fits this case, well, my modeling would still capture it and what it will tell me is that typically the list that will be output by this algorithm will have size 1. So, I would, if I could build codes which work under this model, they would work equally well under this setting and they would just be dominating. And then, hopefully, we don't have to fine-tune our algorithms so that they are tuned to this particular model of noise and to this particular 
uh, all the particular characteristics we associated with the channel. We have a very broad class of channels which is capable of uh, encompassing pretty much everything there. And in the worst case, if all your worst fears are actually true, your list will be a slightly larger size. That's all. Your decoding algorithm will tell you what was the possibility. So this is the model of recovery that we are advocating. What about algorithmic results? Can you actually build codes and decode them effectively? And strangely enough, this thing was never uh, looked at in the literature uh, on communication itself for the longest of times. Uh, in the theory of computer science, this problem started uh, getting some attention due to some work of Levin and then by Goldreich and Levin, where they started actually giving list decoding algorithms for some very esoteric codes. These codes were such that you would never use them in communication, at least not in the, for the settings of parameters where they could get interesting algorithms. But nevertheless, they started looking at this question of list decoding, gave list decoding algorithms, and suggested looking at other codes for the same purpose. The first interesting uh, for normal time algorithms for good codes, I would say, came about from, from some work that we did, and uh, uh, then started receiving a lot of attention in the uh, computer science community, and by now there's a rich literature out there. Uh, I've only stated some very early works, but uh, there's, there's, there's an increasing body of literature over here in the last five to ten years. And uh, let me summarize the main result that comes out of it, and then tell you very briefly some of the um, um, uh, some of the um, ideas that go into some of the decoding algorithms. So the main result that we have achieved now is the following. Consider a binary channel, which is flipping one half minus epsilon fraction of errors. Epsilon is some tiny constant. This is a channel which Shannon says has positive capacity. Shannon's capacity would be something <coughs> like order of epsilon squared for this channel. So, you know, if you get the closer, closer you get to 50% errors, the less and less capacity you will have, but it will be positive. What we can get is codes of rate omega, sorry, uh, of epsilon to the fourth. So something positive, not as large as Shannon promised, in fact, quite a bit worse off. But nevertheless, it's positive, and it says that there are codes whose rate is that much, whose encoding and decoding is for normal time, and will come up with lists of size 1 over epsilon to the 4 or some such thing if there are 1 half minus epsilon fraction errors. So under no circumstance will it produce too large a list. If the ch channel is somewhat more benign, then the list will be of size 1. And we will be able to achieve that rate. So this is, I would say, the an analog of Elias's result in 1955 to Shannon's theorem. So, so an Elias's results to Shannon's theorem and this theorem to the zamlo pinsker result is probably the rough analogy. So we are at a stage where we can say every channel that has positive capacity can be used with positive rate, but we don't have the right rate yet. We would, there's much more work to be done to get further. So here the uh, size of the list is clearly a function of epsilon. The list in sizes... In particular, epsilon is a 1 over some, some negligible quantity. One over two would be some quantity. So then the list size would be something of the order of two to the something, right? Sure. The the list size would be very large, but notice that even Shannon would not be able to promise you much. Sure, sure. Uh, if epsilon was extremely small, Shannon's theorem would say, well, you have to take your message and encode it in right. blocks of size one over epsilon to some huge power. So an inverse dependence on epsilon is natural, is inevitable. In a sense, it's something that we can live with. The list size really is a function of how malicious your model is, your, your errors are. If your errors are malicious, then the list sizes will be large. If they are not, then the list sizes will not. It has very little to do with this theorem, which says that this is an upper bound of the list size. When you see a list of size even 2, you can conclude at that, same, at that stage that any probabilistic modeling that you would have done of this channel would have been wrong. If you're getting lists of size 2, there is an adversary sitting somewhere out there. And that's why you're getting lists of even size 2. So the list sizes, I would say, are much more a function of who's the error, uh, introducing the error than uh, a function of the theorem, which is 
gives you an upper bound, so it will never be too bad. All right, so this is the theorem that I want to talk a little bit about. In order to talk to you about that, I'll try to tell you, uh, Eric, how long should I go? I know I, I delayed it. So I'll tell you a little bit about a family of codes and a list decoding algorithm for these codes. I'll try to make these codes as self-contained as possible and the algorithm as quick as possible. But before I get there, I want to do a, a little bit of a, a, you know, there, there's always this issue when you introduce a new model of recovery, there's always this question of what do you do with this new model? What do you do with the list of candidates? I wanted a single thing. So. Our solution so far has been, let's throw the problem at the user. But let me give you a few other uh, options. Let's not just, we don't have to just throw the problem at the user. There are really good, sane engineering reasons for sticking with, uh, to, to understand this model. The first of which I've already alluded to, if the noise is truly probabilistic, then you can do a probabilistic analysis of the channel and reason that the number of errors would be, uh, the list of would be of size one, with probability close to one. So what does this decoding bias in the setting? It says there is a single algorithm which would have worked no matter which one of these many probabilistic models you pick. Your model may be changing during your transmission and still the same algorithms are going to work at the senders and receivers end. So you really do not have to fine tune anything. The second issue over here is that if there was some other way of disarming waiting between uh, the, the transmitted element and the received element. For example, uh, you, can, you can just, when you're sending the satellite off into space, you can embed in the satellite some secret random string, extremely small of length about logarithmic in the size of the transmission that it expects. And that little piece of shared information can be used to disambiguate between this list. So really there's it's easy to disambiguate ele uh, elements of the list if you have some channel which can transmit a little bit of information from the sender to the receiver, and this transmission could have happened way before the actual transmission, that the actual message was even known to the sender. And this side channel, you can't use it typically because it's, you know, it's extremely expensive to use, the timing constraint says you can't use it at the time that the message is received, but nevertheless you can use, if, the, if it exists, then you can disambiguate. This is a notion proposed by Guruswami et al. And a third model, which is actually one of the most convincing ones, is that uh, is one proposed by Lipton et al. and further refined in some work we did with Nikali et al. Uh, where we feel that you know it's okay to uh, model the adversary, uh, the, the errors to be uh, induced by an adversary, but why should we give away everything to the adversary? In particular, the adversary, no matter how powerful it is, is probably not going to be able to shock, solve NP-hard problems, probably not going to be able to factor integers. And if such is the case, if there is no natural model uh, of computation physically realized which can for a long time factor integers, well then, maybe we can use that, uh, that characterization of nature to restrict our adversary as well. And if you do that, then we can propose ways in which we can use list decoding solutions to make sure that while the adversary could potentially take you to the midpoint between two messages, to do that it would have to solve computationally hard problems. So there are formal the uh, theorems around along these lines, and I'll point you to some literature where you can find more of this. So that being said, I want to tell you a little bit about how do you ever encode information and how do you actually recover information from these? I want to tell you some of the algorithmic insights. Just is, this is part of my passion, so that's the reason why it's being done today. There are many ways of doing list decoding today. Uh, this just happens to be my uh, take on it. Uh, the way we'll actually, so first I have to tell you a little bit about how you actually encode information. Rather than thinking about bits at this stage, let's start thinking about bytes. So let's say our information is stored as a sequence of bytes, an error would flip one byte to another. Once you start looking at this model of errors, you can actually handle a larger fraction of errors. Okay, A byte being, you know, if you have some correlation between what was written and what was read, what should that translate to? You say, well, it's more than 1 over 256 fractions of the messages in, of what you wrote is intact, then you have correlation between what was written and what, what you're reading. Okay, so, so, 
Over here, you can deal with a large fraction of errors, and that's part of the reason why I'm focusing on this case. How do you typically encode information on your CDs, which actually encode it as a sequence of bytes, when you use what's called the Reed Solomon code? What are the Reed Solomon codes? You think of your message, a sequence of, say, 200 bytes, as representing some polynomial. How does it represent a polynomial? You think of a field which has 256 elements, a finite field. If you can't imagine what these are, well, just, just think of integers modulo 256. Roughly, and assume 256 is a prime, that will make it even nicer. <laughs> so, so, think of some such modular arithmetic where all the nice things that you expect to happen, uh, happen. And so your 200 bytes of information represents some polynomial whose degree is 199. Such a polynomial is given by 200 coefficients, and these coefficients are really your information. This is what you want to transmit from the sender to the receiver. How do you uh, represent this information? Now you stop thinking of it as a sequence of bytes, but think of this algebraic object, single object, a polynomial that you want to transmit. So maybe you want to transmit this pink polynomial to the sender, uh, to the receiver, and how do we do it? The way we do it is a priori will agree on a sequence of places where you evaluate this polynomial and send me all of these evaluations. So you say that polynomial evaluated the first location is this, and the second location is that, the third location is that, the fourth is that. This translates your information from, so if you're looking at a field of size 256, then you evaluated at all the 256 elements. It gives you 256 bytes while your original information was only 200 bytes, and presumably this is redundant. Is this even good enough? Can you take the 256 elements that you've got at the end and figure out what the polynomial was? Well, the famous interpolation theorem says, well, if I tell you the value of a polynomial at 200 places, and the degree of the polynomial is at most 199, I can figure out the coefficients. Great, so we know how to figure out the message given its encoding like this. Well, in fact, it tells you a lot more. It says if I erase a few of these values, and I don't tell you what the value here is, and I don't tell you what the value there is, but I still give you more than 200 values, you still have enough information to interpolate. So you can deal with up to 56 erasures. A little bit more work tells us that you can actually deal with correct uh, errors as well. And it's that aspect that I want to tell you about. How do you deal with errors in this setting? I want to tell you an algorithm to deal with errors in this setting. So let me jump to this thing. So we're working, the error correction problem is the following one. You're given some n points, alpha 1, alpha 2, up to alpha sub n, which is the set of places that the sender and the receiver agreed a priori, saying, when I have a polynomial, I will evaluate it at these n places and tell you the value at these n places. We need a field to have n distinct values. Uh, and the same points at which I can evaluate them, which is why we had to work with the sequence of bytes. So let's agree that alpha 1 to alpha sub n are the places I'm the sender, you're the receiver, I'm going to send you the values of a polynomial at alpha 1 to alpha sub n. So we're done. I go away, I find my polynomial, and I now I trans start transmitting the values. P of alpha 1, P of alpha 2, P of alpha 3, and send n values to you, P of alpha sub n. What you receive is some sequence y1, y2, y3, and so on to y sub n. They will not always agree with what I intended to transmit because there are errors. So your goal is to find a polynomial whose degree is at most, let's call it k, such that what I transmitted agrees with what you received for many values of i. The classical theory of error correction said, well, you could deal with this problem provided the number of errors was small enough. How small? Less than half the distance. Well, the distance of this, well, these codes can never be more than 100 percent. So you can deal with about 50 percent errors. That's the limit. Maximum errors that we will ever deal with is 50 percent. I'll show you a scheme which will deal with more than 50 percent errors. Okay? So that should already imply that we can correct a large fraction of errors over here. So we are going to Try to solve this problem. You're given n points, alpha 1 to alpha sub n, y1 to yn. They come from some finite field with q elements, never mind this notation. Um, and there's a parameter t saying that's the number of places where I expect agreement, number of places which are not in error. This is going to be a very small number, and even though it's a small number, we'll try to solve this problem. 
And our goal is to find for Lorentz whose degree is at most k, so that p of alpha i equals y i for many values of i, for at least t values of i. In what follows, in about 10 minutes, I'll try to describe an algorithm to you completely by pictures. And uh, because it's an illustration, it's not the full power of the algorithm, I won't uh, give the pictures for the full uh, description of the algorithm. And to make the pictures nice, I will use k equals 1. Why is this nice? Well, for normal of degree 1 is a straight line. So we'll be drawing straight lines in the plane and trying to find these things. So this is a very nice geometric problem. And we're going to give you an algebraic solution to this geometric problem. And we'll do it on this very special instance of the problem that we work with. So imagine, this is really the problem, you know, encapsulated for you in a very nice example, an instance of the problem. An instance of the problem consists of some number of points on the plane, you know, alpha i, y i. I can write down alpha 1, y 1, alpha 2, y 2, and so on. I can plot them on the plane. We typically play it over some modular arithmetic and so on, but you could also play this game over the real numbers, and then you would get exactly this kind of a picture. In this example, we have some 14 points on the plane. Our goal is to find straight lines, and let's say we want we pick the agreement parameter at 5. So we want to find lines which agree with 5 things. The impact of this example is that we are looking at 14 transmissions, and ex expecting five agreements. So we are allowing for nine errors. The amount of errors that you're getting is much more than the amount of non-errors, the amount of agreements. And still we are hoping to recover. Clearly, these kinds of choices of parameters allow an adversary to create really, really bad sequence of, of errors. And you see that here. The solutions, by now most people would have seen this, there's here's one line which passes through five points, and here's another line which passes through five points. A receiver has no chance at trying to figure out the message uniquely, if that's what it's trying to do, but it can try to find, you know, so what was the potential, what are a list of potential messages, it can try to find it. And we'll show you how to try and solve this problem. In most of the algebraic algorithms that I encounter, there's always one non-trivial step, okay? And this is the non-trivial step here. It's almost completely unintuitive, but Bear with me while we do this, okay? What we're going to do is instead of trying to solve the problem at hand, we're going to solve the problem which we know how to solve. So what's the problem that we know how to solve? You, I'll tell you why we know how to solve this later, but suppose we try and solve this problem and we manage to solve it. What's the problem? Well, we're going to, it's, we are looking for a polynomial in one variable, p of x, of degree 1, which passes through 5 out of 14 points. We're going to sort of syntactically change everything about this thing. Instead of a polynomial in one variable, I look for a polynomial in two variables. Instead of passing through 5 out of 14 points, I'll ask it to pass through all 14 points. And I will allow its degree to be not 1, but 4. So I'll allow terms of the form x to the 4. I'll allow times terms of the form y to the 4. I'll allow terms of the form x squared, y squared, or x times y, etc., etc. All of these terms are allowed. Find a degree 4 polynomial. The only constraint I want to place on it is that it should not be identically zero. But, on the other hand, it should pass through all the points in the, in the following sense. When I look at Q evaluated at alpha i, y, i, at all the points that are given to me, that should evaluate to zero. So, certainly Q of setting all the coefficients of this polynomial to zero would have worked, and that's the only thing that we are ruling out over here. We don't want to allow that. So suppose we manage to find this point polynomial, and turns out, you know, something like that works. This assumes that uh, this point is the origin, this distance is 1, and that distance is 1, and that this is all a linear transformation of the plane. Um, so let's plot the zeros of this polynomial, and they look like that. Okay. So one thing that we see is somehow we looked at this abstract object, I mean this polynomial, and we said let's plot every pair y1, x1, y1, uh, such that this equation goes to zero, and we find all of these zeros, and we find all of these zeros, and we find all of those zeros. And what happens algebraically is that we started, we had a polynomial written as a sum of its monomials, but what this picture is saying is that you should be looking at it in its factored form. 
So you should be writing that polynomial in its factored form. The factor consists of x squared plus y squared minus 1, the circle, y plus x, which is that one, and y minus x, which is that one. And if you write it like that, then it's clear that you know the solutions that you're looking for are sitting there. y plus x is a straight line, y minus x is a straight line, and these are the ones that you're looking for. So once we come up with this sort of a mysterious explanation of this one instance, we can ask questions saying, you know, why did all of this happen? Were we just lucky on this one instance, or was there some theory behind it? And the theory turns out to be extremely simple. Why did this degree 4 polynomial exist? Well, it's a very simple counting argument. When you look at polynomials of degree 4 in two variables, there's actually 15 coefficients that you're looking at. You know, you count all the possible monomials of the form x to the i, y to the j, i plus j is less than or equal to 5, 15 choices of i and j. So you have 15 variables, and what you are imposing as constraints, q of alpha i, y, i equal to 0, when you expand it out, it's a linear constraint in these unknowns. What you don't know are the coefficients, and these constraints are linear constraints in these unknowns. So you have a system of linear equations, 14 equations in 15 unknowns, and these are all homogeneous. Homogeneous meaning if I had set all the Q coefficients to zero, then that would have worked as a solution. But we don't want to set all the coefficients to zero. We insist on that. So we are asking for a non-trivial solution to a homogeneous system of linear equations, and that always has a non-trivial solution provided the number of variables is more than the number of constraints. We have 15 variables, 14 constraints, yes we do. So the fact that we found the polynomial which had satisfied these constraints, that it was a degree 4, passed to 14 points, but was not at degree 0, was not a coincidence. It always exists. Unfortunately, this argument basically says if you want to find one passing through 13 points, in fact, there's two solutions, and in fact, there's a two-dimensional space of solutions. Which one of these should we have picked? so that this line would appear in there. The other aspect over here is that actually it doesn't matter which solution you pick if you want these lines to appear. And the reason for that is the following. Consider this line. It's a curve of algebraic degree 1 in the plane. This solution that you found is a curve of algebraic degree 4 in the plane. There is a famous theorem called Bezout's theorem in the plane which says that if you take two curves whose so degrees are d1 and d2, and they have more than d1 times d2 points in common, that means they have some fundamental component in common. A straight line is a component by itself, so the straight line must appear in, as a component. What that tells you is that this line must be a factor of any degree 4 polynomial which passes through those 5 points. Okay. If you find any degree 4 polynomial passing through those four, 5 points, then that line must be, appear, must be there as a factor. So this was not a coincidence, in fact it was to be expected. And together these two lemmas, these two se sentences are easily generalizable. We can do so, which says basically the counting argument generalizes, uh, scales very nicely, you can try to find, if I give you n points in the plane, there's a curve of degree square root of n and x, square root of n and y passes through all of the points. And now if you take that curve and you're looking for any polynomial whose degree, sorry, is little d, then if they happen to have more than little d times capital D points in common, then this polynomial y minus p of x will divide that. So these two are a fact, and they scale very nicely with the degree. Yes, question? You have to be a little more careful with this, right? Because the point can be an infinity, and the, there's uh, no way you're guaranteeing that the field is unpretty so. Actually, the version of the theorem that we're using here is a uh, is the easy direction, supposedly, of Bezout's theorem. It says that the number of intersections cannot be too large. Right. There is a hard part of the Zoom theorem which says that if the field is nice and Right, but what if the points were at infinity, which is not being counted here? So you have to be assuming that you're looking for the lines as the solution, that's why it's working out. Right, so, so we, yes, it's definitely this particular analysis uses the fact that the lines are irreducible, but it, uh, it just says, well, if there are so many points right here in common, there may be others further out that are in common, which we are even ignoring. It already implies what we wish. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I can handle that question offline uh, better, I think. All right, so roughly what happens over here is that this, uh, you can sort of fine-tune this algorithm a little bit and get 
agreement down. So as presented, the lemmas would combine to say, well, if the number of points of agreement is greater than k, the degree of the polynomial times square root of n, the total number of transmissions, then you can correct errors. Then you can then you can find the polynomial that you were interested in. You can squeeze the, the k inside the square root by some simple uh, algebraic manipulation. And then a lot of work that we did with Guru Swami sort of got rid of this too, gave us a very nice result, but I won't get into it uh, in the limited negative amount of time that I have. And instead just tell you a little bit about what's been going on uh, since. Um, so this was the algorithm for Ray Solomon codes that led to the list coding of some codes. Using standard techniques in coding theory, one can use the, this along with um, uh, standard techniques in coding theory to, to get the theorem that I described, the one which says that uh, you can transmit a binary, you can construct binary codes which can transmit at positive rates over channels of positive capacity, uh, even allowing for adversarial error. So you can get that easily. But this particular algorithm has some other consequences which were discovered by Kutter and Vardy. And in particular, when we started off with this algorithm, we thought this was something merely of theoretical interest. We can correct lots of errors, but it's a list decoding algorithm, and it's probably much, much more slow. Kutter and Vardy uh, beefed up the algorithm so that it was really, really running fast. It started competing with, it's, it's competitive with Berlekamp Massey, which is the standard algorithm in most of your uh, Ray Solomon code uh, decoders. By the way, every one of you is probably working with one Ray Solomon decoder or the other at some point or the other. DVD players, CD players, your hard disks on your computer drives are all encoded with Ray, uh, Ray Solomon codes. Their decoders are sort of part of every one of these uh, decoding machines. And uh, they improved, Cutter and Marty sort of started competing with actual uh, algorithms and um, also found some very nice consequences, think, uh, side effects that we had not exploited in, uh, in our own works, where they could sort of look at the decoding problem that a channel typically faces, uh, look at some of the information that we tended to throw away because we, were, you know, we just didn't know how to deal with some of the extra information. When you get, read a byte, you don't get a corrupted byte, you don't just get a vanilla corrupted byte which says, I'm something else, not the what was written, but rather you get some information saying it could have been this, it could have been that, and I think it was sort of likely that the, the symbol written there was something with probability 80% and something else with probability 10%, and maybe these five other things with probability 2% uh, each, something like that, and they could start making use of these okay. kinds of information, and this really sort of beats up actual capacities of actual channels which are being used. Uh, there's one example of this uh, decoder actually being deployed where uh, there's this bunch of ham radio experts who are uh, 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 trying to, you know, see how much can they use the ham radio to, to send signals, how much signal to noise ratio can they uh, achieve from ham radios in, in all sorts of bizarre circumstances. One of the things that they're trying to do is send signals out to the moon and get it to bounce back and say what kind of signal to noise ratio can you get out of this. So the moon is a very passive player, it just reflects signals, apparently even reflects ham radio signals back to the earth. But that they're so good at doing that they now want to do it out of comet rails. And comet rails are a little bit more flaky, but you can imagine that we are getting to a point where the signal to noise ratios are getting pretty low. And uh, they are getting uh, a noticeable gain. I don't know what these numbers mean, but they get a noticeable gain by using this version of the Reef Solomon decoding algorithm over there. So a, the very fact that they can run this algorithm and get it to, you know, work within their time frame is very significant, and it's actually giving them effective gains. So that's roughly what uh, turned out as a side effect from the list decoding thing. So I'll conclude now and just say that, you know, so what I was hopefully trying to say is that list decoding is a meaningful, useful, and feasible notion of error correction. Uh, it takes us away from the standard paradigm where communication had been stuck, where we were looking at a few algorithms uh, and fixing them and trying to vary a lot of codes around them. It is possible to vary algorithms. The state of algorithmic research is at a sufficiently mature uh, point now that we can really think of algorithms as variables and vary them to the extent that Shannon and Hamming would have liked us to. And uh, there's a lot of theoretical consequences to the fact 
in computer science, uh, starting with the work of Goldreich and Levin, to the fact that we can actually deal with positive correlation between the sender and the receiver even when the adversary is malicious. This has major cryptographic uh, implications uh, and that's already been used in the theoretical computer science. I think the main challenge ahead is to find more practical uses. I mean, we quite often we take a certain threshold on the amount of error that we can correct as a fixed point and we say, well, we'll design all our engineering systems subject to this limitation of the amount of errors. Now that that threshold is moving, uh, shouldn't we sort of rethink what kind of, you know, how densely you pack information in your CDs and your DVDs? These are, these are all questions that can be uh, re-examined under this context as well. Uh, and that, that would work 
potentially also, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a very nice question. I don't know what, uh, what we can do. Any other questions? I have one announcement. Uh, even though I encourage you to plow the rules, please do uh, pick up your trash so that we uh, can keep the administration happy. And uh, 